thank you everyone for being here um, with us. I will start presenting uh, the two speakers and uh, then we will have uh, some questions and they will debate and discuss and then we will have a final turn in which uh, we open the floor to, to the rest of you so you can also be part of the conversation. Okay? So, um, first, I uh, will welcome Michael Moroi, who has conducted extensive uh, participant observation research in industrial places, addressing issues like postcolonialism, consent to advanced capitalism, class consciousness, and the challenges of the Soviet transition to capitalism. Over five decades, he developed the extended case method, allowing broad conclusions from ethnographic studies. In collaboration with graduate students, he co-authored Global Ethnography, advocating for studying globalization from below by immersing in the life of those experiencing it. Unable to continue factory studies, he shifted to researching his own workplace, the university, to examine how sociology is produced and disseminated, promoting the concept of public sociology. Recently, he, along with graduate students, has been developing a labor theory of pedagogy. In his career, Borowai served as president of the American Sociological Association and the International Sociological Association, funded the magazine Global Dialogue, and played leadership roles at Berkeley. After 47 years at Berkeley, he left to engage with global issues. Thank you, Michael. And next we have uh, Ramon Fletcher who is the first scientist in the world in the categories of social impact and gender violence in the Google Scholar ranking. He is Emeritus Professor at the University of Barcelona and the ADD Grass Professor at the Julius Maximilians Universitat in Wolfsburg. And he's also Dr. Norris Causa at the University of Timisoara. Fletcher's research stands out for a joint impact in the scientific, political and social spheres. He is and has been PI of five projects of the European Framework of Research and he has been president of the group of experts on evaluation methodologies for the intermediate and exposed evaluations of Horizon 2020, DG Research and Innovation, and he has led the creation of impact indicators for the research projects of the European Commission's Research Framework Program. Fletcher is a scientific director of uh, Social Impact SL, a social enterprise dedicated to helping organizations improve the social impact and author of the book, The Dialogical Society, the sociology that people of science and citizenship like and use, which has been translated into five languages. So after uh, having presented our two speakers today, I will start with the first of the questions. And, sorry, and you can uh, answer as you want. You can also reply to each other if you prefer. So really, uh, it's a very, very open dialogue. So, um, First of all, in which ways sociological theory has contributed to the values of equality and democracy? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me here and allowing me to speak this imperial language of English. And yes, I've been in this room, or some parallel room, a number of times before. Always been a very exciting experience. And I'm sure it will be very exciting today. I've never had an open public dialogue with Ramon before. <laughs> but we're in the world of the dialogic society, so naturally we should be engaged in dialogue. Okay, Elizabeth, so you asked me the impact, apparently that's the word of the season, <laughs> the impact of sociological theory on the development of democracy and equality. Look, there's a real problem in this question. Okay. <laughs> um, first of all, what is sociological theory? Second, what is democracy? And third, what is equality? And if you don't spell out what they mean, about which, of course, there's been much debate, it's really difficult to move forward. 
So I'm just going to give you an indication of the complexity of the concepts and let Maman answer the question. <laughs> so, sociological theory or social theory. I always think of it in three levels. And I follow Antonio Gramsci in the idea that we are all theorists. We all have an understanding of the world, and without that understanding, we couldn't live. You all sort of anticipate that there is going to be a continuing discussion between myself, Ramon, and Elizabeth for the next, how long are we doing this for? An hour. Okay. So it, we live in a world of making predictions. Uh, we cannot live without making predictions. And to do make predictions, you have to have a theory of the world. And what is often very interesting is that the predictions don't turn out to be the case. And then we're forced to think about what was wrong with our theory. This is a theory that Gramsci would call common sense. But it's theory. We have a theory of the world. And I'm going to call that common sense. Sociologists sort of move a bit to the next level. And they sort of begin to try and generalize from different people's, in a sense, common senses, their engagement with the world. And we get what friend of Ramon, Robert Merton, you're a friend of Robert Merton, right? Yeah, I thought so. Um, I was not a friend of Robert Merton. Robert Merton wanted to eliminate me from sociology, <laughs> but he died before he succeeded. Um, so, yeah, I'm still alive. Um, you know, the victors can always construct history afterwards. Yes, they are the ones that shape history. Anyway, that's the, that's the that when you get to my age, you'll be full of digressions. Um, uh, but the point is, there is this middle range theory which actually tries to link um, people's behavior to particular sub disciplines of sociology, whether it be political sociology, whether it be criminology, whether it be gender studies. There, there are these sub fields which have their own distinctive framework. Um, that is a sort of an abstraction, if you will, of the common senses uh, of average people um, and not so average people. So we have in, in, in sociology these middle range theories. And Merton was, was a proponent of those middle range theories. Theories, and in his case, theories of bureaucracy were very important. Uh, he engaged the work of Max Weber, the very famous essay on bureaucracy, and he began to develop ideas and his students, a sort of research program developed around the consequences of bureaucracy, the internal workings of bureaucracy, the variations in the form of bureaucracy. That's a middle range theory. So we got this sort of latent theory of common sense that we all carry, middle range theory, and then we have grand theory, which in a sense tries to establish more totalizing visions of the world. I think that grand theory sort of has to have certain assumptions about um, who, what sustains of sociology, what society is. It has assumptions about the values that drive I have a set of values that drive the conception of society, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. These are ones I'm a particularly big fan, which I'm sure I will mention again, W.E.B. Du Bois, who has become a major figure in US sociology over the last decade or two. Um, but these grand theorists have sets of values that direct their concerns. They have novel theories. They have novel ways of studying the world. Um, they have a theory of history and by implication a notion of the future um, and they borrow that, and they have a set of methodological assumptions about who we are as human beings. They spell out some fundamental attributes um, uh, of, of the world that they're studying. Um, and, they have a, and we as sociologists organize debates among these grand theorists. Um, and they are quite profound. Of course, in these days, I don't know about Barcelona, but um, these days, these grand theorists are called into question because they are, if we talk about Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, they are white guys from the 19th century and have a set of assumptions that people find 
problematic. The great thing about great theorists is that they establish what those assumptions are. So the claim is that they do not actually appreciate the significance of the, what we would now call the, the ex-colonized world, the global south. They have a very European view, um, and they have a sort of limited view when it comes to gender, or when it comes to race, and have been pushed aside um, by emerging generations of graduate students. And there's an interesting debate in the United States as to whether we should hang on to these theorists or not, which we may or may not talk about. Anyway, those are the grants. So there are three levels. Now let me just very quickly say about democracy and, 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 and equality. Democracy can be liberal democracy. It can be, I think Eric Wright has been hanging around Barcelona from time to time. He talks about deepening democracy, a participatory democracy. Those are just one distinction amongst the ideas of democracy, the radical democracy versus liberal democracy. And then there's equality. I mean, then there's equality of opportunity, equality of outcomes. And so there are, there are also, there's much to discuss about the meaning of equality. And then, of course, we have to also talk about the relation between equality and democracy. Whoa! Before we can ever get to the consequences. I think we have to really interrogate the concepts. So, having interrogated the concepts, I can now pass it on to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I am to answer the questions then, yeah, because I know Elizabeth and I know that I should do that. Yeah? <laughs> uh, I, I answer this question with uh, three ideas. The first one is that uh, uh, sociology and like commerce social science uh, are daughters and part of democracies. They were created by democracy and they are contributing always to democracy with the analysis of the steps society can do and institutions can do to go to the own objectives of citizens. This was the main point of the one sociologist, I think is the founder, really, of sociology, that is Jane Adams, maybe the women, yeah, uh, has provoked that she is not mentioned. But if we uh, look at the contributions that sociology has made to equality and democracy, and we discover yeah, how we have analyzed discriminations by gender, by race, by socioeconomic status, or social class, and so on. And those were the points that Jane Adams, Herbert Mead, and all their colleagues yeah, raised. Of course, there are other sociologists that do this, did the same. For instance, Marian Weber do much more did much more than much better, and so on. And if we look now also to the sociologists yeah, developing their professions in city councils and so on, they, most of them are dealing with this kind of uh, discriminations and how to overcome the, those discriminations. So I think we can be happy to be sociologists because we have contributed to democracy and to equality. The second point is that uh, other institutions, sociologists and sociology, and mainly academic sociology, has suffered a process of bureaucratization during the 20th century. And at the end, simply, wrongly, even that we sociologists is should say to the society which ideology they should come from. Many times, eh, sociologists, we have substituted the scientific analysis for our ideological positions. And this has been very bad for sociology, very bad for ideologies and very bad for society. Even provoking errors 
like, no, asking the policy makers to follow our positions. No? For instance, evidence based policy. It seemed like policy makers that were voted by citizens should do eh, what we think they should do. And still worse, eh? we have supported eh, very dictators. Eh? Many stories have been in favor of dictators and so on. And that has created a crisis of legitimation of sociology and society, a rejection mainly by scientists from other sciences, from physics, from medicine and so on, in a rejection of many citizens with ideologies that are not the ideologies of the sociologists. No? Even some potatoes have created their own sociology, and many sociologists have supported this. For instance, in Spain, Franco, in the Valle de los Caídos, created the sociology that most catedraticals, most professors, anywhere followed when I studied eh, sociology. Eh? But also Stan Smith and also had the support in many sociologists. Those errors are a process of bureaucratization and eh, of bureaucratization, eh? not following the democratic objectives of citizens, but particular ones. No? The third point is that in the last decades, years, many sociologists, and not an increasing number of sociologists, are recuperating the original ideas of democratic and egalitarian ideas of sociology, and they are doing an other kind of work in favor of democracy, in favor of equality, making analysis, and knowing that we are a social servants. We are not the ones to lead society. The ones to lead society should be elected by citizens, and no one votes us. No? We are civil servants. In that sense, I would like to outline two sociologists, or two sociologists eh, that have been very important inside, and both have been explained in this room. One is the, uh, of course, the public sociology, Michael, and the other one is the theory of real utopias by uh, Eric Collinwright, that has been very important in saying, no, no, sociology is for the public and with the public, and of course we cannot get utopias, but we can make steps, real steps, yeah, to those utopias, and uh, I think we need that. But we also need trajectories, very things, yeah, professional, personal, uh, scientific, like the ones of Michael and Eric, taking position in his case, Michael, since the beginning, yeah, in favor of any victim of sexual harassment in the universities. Most sociologists cannot say that. Most professors of sociology in Spain cannot say that. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see that? You would like to add anything to what Ramon said? Oh, yes, I would like to. Add. <laughs> Yeah, Ramon has a very optimistic view of sociology and of the world, which I think many sociologists actually are. They wouldn't be sociologists unless they were optimistic that the values that they are committed to are realizable in real institutions. But you know, I think of sociology as a terrain of struggle. It's interesting you bring up Franco. I mean, yes, Franco had his own sociologist, very committed to the idea of, yeah, nah, you can't do that. You know, we're not. No, Ramon, you can't do that. You think you're in a supermarket. You think you're in a supermarket, you can just pick anything off the shelf, whatever you want, and you go out and don't even pay for it. No, that's not the world. You have to face the reality that we have sociologists that 
unlike the ones that we support. That sociology is a terrain of struggle. And that's what you've been involved in. And you can't just say, aren't oh, they not scientists that we can forget about them? Because in the world out there, there are sociologists who are not on your side. Right? So, hmm? <laughs> so I, I think, as I say, that what the great thing about sociology is that it is a terrain of struggle. And why is sociology this sort of terrain of struggle? Um, in my view, sociology takes the standpoint of civil society. That is neither state nor economy, but it is. It's, it takes a, it's not just studying civil society, but it takes the standpoint of civil society. And civil society is made up of all sorts of conflicting groups. And therefore, if we are to be true to the world in which we live, it is not surprising we have different sociologists. And I know you don't like it here, and I, so I'm going to continue to talk about Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. They represent three different visions of the world from the standpoint of different places in society. Marx takes a standpoint, more or less, of the subordinated, you might even be more specific, of the working class. Weber is more interested um, in in taking the standpoint of organizations in civil society and how they function and what complications that generates. Durkheim is interested in the standpoint of building solidarity across civil society. There is a war amongst these three and of course others. And that's my first point that yeah, sociology is a terrain of struggle and I think that's what I find appealing that fighting for, Eric fighting for real utopias was a real struggle with the utopians but also with sociology. It's, it's a fortunate that I ever survived as a sociologist because of struggles in sociology and we're, we're interested to hear the biography of Ramon about how he survived with his values in sociology in Spain through the Franco period, yeah? Interesting, I've heard many stories from him about that. Anyway, so that's one point, train of struggle. The other point is this faith in science. Ah, oh. you know, I have a passion these days for a fellow called W.B. Du Bois, I mentioned him earlier. He was an African-American sociologist born in 1868 and died when he was 96 years old in 1963. And I could talk for days about this guy, but I want to just give you one little capsule of his life. He began in, he, began, he was actually the first African American to get a PhD from Harvard. Got a PhD in history. And he then went to, before he had finished that PhD, he went to Germany. There was no sociology in the United States in the 1890s, but it was, a, it was an emergent discipline in Germany. And there he got infatuated with sociology, along with Max Weber. Um, and he was taught by these well-known well professors, University of Berlin. And he came back after two years there passionate and committed to sociology, like Ramon. <laughs> and he started doing research. He was, given, he was not given an opportunity to be in, a, uh, in a, one of the elite universities, which is where he belonged. He was clearly a genius, and I don't think there is much dispute about that, but he was of the black skin, made it impossible for him to um, be part of the major universities. He got a position in a black university, a liberal arts university, and he then was given the chance to do a study in Philadelphia. It had just become a canonical study of Philadelphia. It's called the Philadelphia Negro. He believed that if we do a scientific study... <laughs> See, they don't like science here, I mean, right? <laughs> 
um, if you do a scientific study of the behavior of African Americans in the Seventh Ward, if you examine and try and explain their behavior, not as a function of their race, but as a function of the social situation into which they find themselves, then that truth, that scientific truth, he, uh, he did 5,000, uh, he talked to about 5,000 people in the end, at the end of this study. It was a very thorough scientific study. And he thought that if he could just convey to the wider population that African Americans, like everybody else, they sort of respond to the social situation in which they find themselves, shaped by the history, the biographies that they come to those situations with, then racism would evaporate. Just bring truth, scientifically discovered truth, to the population, and racism will disappear. He believes an enlightenment thinker, thinker. But no, we all know that that's not going to push the world in a progressive direction. And he discovered it through his own practice. He built up the Atlanta School of Sociology with this vision of actually bringing truth to the white population. But enlightenment thinkers are a bit optimistic. They believe that everybody's rational, and he realized very quickly that actually what's driving racism is not necessarily rational, will not be disturbed by science, but is deeply irrational and is about the commitment of people to economic interests. So, to cut a bow, cut, this is just the beginning of his life. So, he leaves academia and he becomes a political figure. A sociologist in the public realm. He has to engage with those on a political level who disagreed with him, who were supporting racism. And that was his life for the next for the next 50 years. He was in the university from 1897 to 1910, Atlanta University, another black university, and then he became a very big figure as an activist. He built the first um, major civil rights organization in the United States, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. He was the editor of the Crisis magazine from 1910 to 1934, the most significant uh, magazine for African Americans at the time. He became involved in socialist movements, civil rights movements, peace movements. The US state didn't like him, indicted him as being a uh, a, a, a foreign, a, a, an agent of a foreign principle, I mean, his sympathies for the Soviet Union and for China made him an enemy of the state. He was persecuted and eventually was forced to, well, he was, his life was made miserable in the United States and he took exile in Africa. All I'm saying is that he quickly realized that science is important and he never let go of that, but science by itself Without political engagement in what he calls propaganda, science will not deliver the impact, the impact, the impact <laughs> that you would like. All right, that's my little sermon. <laughs> okay. I can include my answer in the next question. Okay. So. Um, Oh, sorry, that's right. You've got your mind. Yes. <laughs> Very sexist in my I don't believe that you can have an autonomous Well, you come from an autonomous university, you must have an autonomous mind. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, moving to the second question. Um, and taking into account everything that you've said about uh, uh, sociological theory, do you think that we should keep uh, uh, teaching courses of sociological theory nowadays and, and why? <laughs> well, we knew previously the questions, and in that one I prepared two points, but I will add a third point in order to answer. <laughs> uh, the priorities of all sciences now, thank you to the contribution from sociology, but now the priorities in the research in cancer and in everywhere, in every kind of field, are uh, social impact and co-creation. 
Uh, maybe we'll start by co-creation, no? because uh, it links what, uh, what Michael was saying about Gramsci. Gramsci, no? the best Marxist intellectual. No? The best intellectual? <laughs> of militant, if you like. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, anyone has no rights. Anyone, even illiterate people. So, the criteria of co-creation is a democratic criteria, but it's also a scientific criteria, and we're going to defend science. Uh, because if we make knowledge in continuous dialogue with all kinds of people, and not only our colleagues in the university, not only we are contributing to this democracy and transforming society, we are having much more excellent intellectual and scientific knowledge. Yeah? And this is a criteria that now uh, some natural science are following, that social science is not following in general, unless some exceptions. No? And I think that we should teach the students yeah, to do that, not by I received yeah, the knowledge of sociology has been distant from the subject. No? Distant. Yeah? Just uh, the opposite. And the other priority is social impact, of course, that we should contribute to the objectives of citizens. No? And they should have, as the Declaration of Human Rights says, they should have participation in the creation of knowledge and also benefits from the creation of knowledge. We cannot follow investing 3 million euros in research in poverty yeah? and then yeah, to have not really an improvement of poor people. Yeah? As has been typical yeah, in social science, yeah? just to make diagnosis and to criticize and the poor people do not receive nothing from that. And now I'm going to the third point that is a discussion here. It's about science and ideology. Franco decided to eh, ask one member of the regime, eh, also of his family, Serrano Sunier, to create one sociology that destroyed, and could destroy the sociology no, that was at that time in Spain. Serrano Sunier was the member of the Franco regime that was more in favor with Hitler. Mm? And they called this, what they were doing, eh, fascist ideology, they called it sociology. Mm? It was made in the Valle de los Caídos. I have in my home all the books and all the people that collaborated with that. Should we accept, this is the question as former president of international, should we accept a sociology, anything, eh, any ideology, eh, that someone with power, even through military cop, say a sociology? My answer is no. Ideology is one thing, science yeah? is another. No? So you cannot eh, use the label of sociology for the ideology of Saramosonia. Yeah, but what, but I think I don't disagree with the first two points, the co-creation of knowledge. And the importance of having an impact. I hate that. I'm going to have a footnote here. I hate the word impact. Impact in English, I have no idea about Spanish, let alone Catalan. Um, impact, it's like a billiard ball metaphor. You, you hit something and you change it. I just don't think of the world as a sociologist. I don't think of the world in terms of this billiard ball. 
I think that the world is made up of social relations in what? Dialogue. And that is a very different metaphor than impact. Impact is this very instrumental thing. And you want to see the result immediately. But actually, as we know from reading your book, actually what is important, and this is what you say in the first point, the co-creation of knowledge, it is a dialogue. You're not just hitting people over the head. You're recognizing them as human beings and having a dialogue with them. That is not impact. Anyway. Um, yes. Yeah, science and ideology. It's an interesting question whether you can always distinguish between science and ideology. Sociology, even the great sociologists of perhaps a contemporary period, your man, Robert Merton, his ideas around bureaucracy and his ideas about the way that bureaucracy tends to ritualize relations and can very easily be used by those who run bureaucracies to establish better bureaucracies with your language, more impact. Um, liberal sociology, some of the best scientific sociology United States, for example, James Coleman, using his analysis of racism, done very scientifically, can be used not for what he intended it, but for actually reproducing racism. So it becomes ideology. And, well, of course, what was interesting about the Soviet Union is that sociology was the ideology of the party state and indeed was an ideology and was not subject to the critical examination of science. I will grant you that. But I think that our own sociology, see, you're into impact. You know, you've got this company that is studying impact, right? And how, and how these enterprises are meeting their targets, their claims about how they're improving the world and how they may better improve the world and then the, these corporations say, ah, I'm saving the world, while they are exploiting so many workers and consumers. So your science can easily be turned into ideology. That's the trick and the puzzle and the challenge. How one can sustain that commitment to, to science at the same time as actually sort of bringing about some engagement with the world. That is what I learned from W.B. Du Bois, that he continued to be a sociologist, but as an editor. And he was concerned to combine somehow science and ideology. Yeah, I guess I know. <laughs> oh, you don't want to say it's happening. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we're going to move on to the last question. So, uh, we keep our focus on sociological theory and, and how can we make it more relevant in today's world? Because you're too. I am doubting if uh, saying what I was debating before, I am doubting if the uh, answer created the question or answer you. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, first point. Uh, in my view, we should develop acting theories, mm -hmm. acting, yeah? human action theories, mm -hmm. because it's uh, the only ones that provide citizens, uh, policy makers and institutions with the possibility to transform the reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a very wide uh, vision of this uh, human action theories, no? I can include uh, many, uh, of course, Habermas theories of action, Jane uh, Adams and so on, but in order to have a more intensive debate with Michael, uh, I will include uh, the theory of society and community made by Parsons, uh, 
that I in my opinion is very useful also axial theory of um, this time. No? Uh, the second point, I prepared three, no? the second point is that um, we should criticize yeah? a structuralist uh, or structuralist theories for two reasons. No? One of them, yeah? in the case of post-structuralism, that say that nothing is good or bad, and nothing is true or fake. Uh, the first point, nothing is good or bad. Many sociologists have had, in my opinion, the error, even to present as a reference, even for sexual education, of one intellectual, in favor of pederasty and in favor of sexual violence. Michel Foucault. When I was the chair of the scientists eh, for different fields for developing the concept of social impact by the European Commission, they were totally upset and against that in social science and even in education, we had as reference people like Michel Foucault. Mm -hmm. That is against one of the main objectives of citizens is to overcome violence in sexual and personal relationships. Really, the rejection of scientists to this kind of reference, scientists in general, but the rejection of some citizens when they know this is that all. But not only say nothing is good or bad. They say that nothing is truth. They are against science, of course, and against sociology. Nothing is true or fake. That allowed them to say very elementary errors that if were in one exam of secondary school, they will fail. Foucault, a lot, a lot. Just yes. one. In one book, he writes. In my previous book, I have not used never the word structure. You go to this book, and he has used the word structure more than 70 times. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. The followers are with a so low intellectual level that it has. They have not faith in science. They have faith in Michel Foucault, that is, in my opinion, much worse. They read nothing, eh? even so. Eh, I don't know if you can realize, for instance, in my conversations with Nobel Prize of Medicine, eh? the one that created the machines that you and me, eh? we have used it. Eh? Or the one who created yeah, and invented the relation between uh, what is, uh, what is, I don't know, the moment space. When they realize that we are following one guy so bad that was totally in favor of sexual violence and sexual rape, and that this kind of so elementary errors. Sociology goes down. Yeah? Only criticizing those people, yeah? sociology can go up. Yeah? And the third is that we know we need uh, uh, clean trajectories, no? like the Jews. No? Yeah? Sociologists, people normally talk about freedom and democracy, that they practice it. We cannot have a reference people like Boaventura Sosa Santos and so on, because it's terrible for society. We cannot have reference that are in favor of dictators, because we cannot say we are working for democracy and supporting dictators. 
but I hope that what I say about actions would provoke it. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Um, yeah. All right. We'll, we'll we'll start with what you said. Um, Parsons, Talcott Parsons. I don't know if any has anybody ever read Talcott Parsons here. Well, you know, if I were to do this with an American audience, there'd be nobody would stick up their hand. Only in foreign countries do they read Talcott Parsons. <laughs> I remember I was wandering around the Soviet Union and I did quite often in the 19, well, the 1990s and 1980s and the textbook they were using, fascinating enough, was the one of my colleague Neil Smelser, who was one of Parsons' most important students. Talcott Parsons, for those who don't know, was probably the most significant sociologist of the 1950s. He then disappeared. Um, but it's interesting why he disappeared. Because he had a vision of society that was based on what we, he called value consensus. It was a view of harmony. And then 1960s were an explosion of social movements. And so his theory and his assumptions were completely out of sync with what was going on in the world. And his project was to provide a sociology where there was an alternative to Soviet Marxism, I underline Soviet Marxism, the ideology of the Soviet Union, presented as Marxist-Leninism, Soviet Marxism. And so he was presenting in this harmonious way the view of the United States of America. Science, it was all science, but it was justifying, celebrating the wonders of the United States as a harmonious society that was not like the authoritarian regimes, but was actually a liberal democracy, almost a utopia when you, talk, when you actually read his writings. You think he's talking about some future communism, but no, he's talking about the United States. So there is the science that has been used again as an ideology to actually celebrate the great American society. Then graduate students started engaging undergraduates, broader population in struggles for the expansion of civil rights, anti-war movements, feminist movements, all challenged both the harmony idea and that somehow this was a wonderful democracy that potentially was including everybody, but it actually was excluding. This is Talcott Parsons as ideologist. And yet, even this ideologist, you can extract interesting and important ideas. Ideas about the relations of people that have to involve complementary role expectations, that the way that we think about other people should be the way that they think about us. So it created a vision, actually, of an alternative communist society. It was not the United States of America. So there are things to be gleaned from Parsons, even though he was an ideologist. And you can see where I'm going. Foucault. I think Roman raises a very important question. Should we dismiss theories of theorists that violate our norm standards of justice and humane behavior? If we were to do that, Weber would go, Durkheim would go, Marx would go, I don't know about Jane Addams. Um, I, I'm, I'm very, I find this deeply problematic to actually reduce theory to the theorist. I think that we should be cognizant of who the theorist is, we should understand how theory gets produced by particular individuals, but not to dismiss the theory on the grounds of the behavior of the theorist. We should, if we're scientists, in my view, evaluate the theory on its own terms. 
And so we do rescue Marx, Marx's writings from Marx the individual, and we can rescue Foucault from the behavior of Foucault. We can rescue Althusser from the behavior of Althusser. That's how we can rescue the theory of Althusser from the behavior of Althusser. And coming back to Foucault, he was an empirical scholar. He was questioning science because he saw that science was actually being continued to use as an instrument of ideology. We have to take that seriously. That our science, the science of racism was very popular in the 1910s and 20s in the United States and elsewhere. It was seen to be the true science, justifying racism. Yes, you can say that science is not one that we want to accept today, but at the time it was accepted. So science, and this is Foucault's point, science can be very easily mobilized in the interests of the dominant groups in society. And so speaking of Foucault, Discipline and Punish probably is the most widely of his books, widely read of his books. And there he makes a distinction between sovereign power and disciplinary power. Sovereign power is the power of the dictator. It is captured by the execution of Damien. Public execution that terrifies the population. That is sovereign power. Disciplinary power is much more subtle. It works through institutions. It works through surveillance. It works through normalization. It works through examination. And it actually captures the imagination of many people, my own students, undergraduate students. They can see suddenly the world through a new lens that makes sense to them when they read the Foucault's account of disciplinary power and the idea of the panopticon. The panopticon has become so much part in this digital world of our lives. And this comes to my last point about teaching, which I never answered before. But I taught theory, a year-long theory course, for 47 years. I did so because it was always, I knew the material back to front, at least the material I was delivering. But it was always so exciting to see students really understand the world. When they read Durkheim, they had one vision. When they read Weber, they hated Weber. But after four or five weeks of reading two or three essays, they began to see the world as a bureaucracy to see the world in terms of the significance of religion, to see the significance of religion within capitalism. And when they read Marx, they saw a whole new world. There's something called capitalism as a system that reproduces itself, and as it reproduces itself, it destroys itself. And they say, well, it doesn't happen. Well, when we have to go and read Nancy to explain why it doesn't happen. And then we read feminism, which is a critique of all those guys, because the feminists, insist on putting the individual actually in the society. The theorist is part of society. That's one of the most significant contributions of feminism, in my view. Which, and these guys were seeing the world from outside. The greatness of theory is that it expands the imagination how the, how the world can be, and how actually there are different ways of thinking about the world that make sense to different people. Yeah. So I'm a firm believer, as is Ramon, in the power of social theory to expand the idea of what can be, the possibilities. That is what we have to do as sociologists, is to make people understand, that the, and ourselves, to understand that the world does not have to be the way it is. That is very important. And if you read theory, then you can see that the world does not have to be the way it is. Because these things have different imaginations of the past, present, and future. So yeah, 
That's not quite impact, but it's very important these days when it's very difficult to think of alternatives to capitalism, hence the significance of Eric Only Wright's work on real utopias. Yeah. All right, I should stop. I'm sorry, I'm going on. Thank you very much. I think we can open uh, some few questions with the public. We were talking about dialogue, so let's invite um, everyone to speak. I don't know if there's anyone who has a question who would like to make a question. Or has some strong views. Yes, exactly, a reflection. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, both of you, and also Isabel, because I think it's been extremely interesting to have two the best two uh, sociological theory professors in town, in the same room, discussing these relevant questions that we are all facing uh, in, our, in our profession. So I think that uh, there are many things that I want to comment. First, um, regarding this question of separating the theory from the th theories, um, I, I disagree with you, Michael, because I think that, for instance, in the case of Michel Foucault, uh, he was a, a confessed uh, pederast, and now, I mean, it's, it's extremely shocking uh, uh, to see how uh, there are still people who are quoting and using his work to defend uh, sexual freedom, for instance. So I think that it's different uh, when the, the, your theories are uh, actually um, uh, uh, used and, and so there is a, a, a big contradiction here. So I think that it's different from other instances, but in this case, I, I think that it's very clear that, uh, and uh, it might happen that people have, have a read Foucault, you know, and then they are just repeating uh, what they heard, uh, that maybe some professors have told them about Foucault, but this, I think that this is a different uh, issue. Uh, then another thing I want to say is, um, uh, even uh, I want to, to, to take over what Roman said that sociology is the daughter of, of democracy because I really like this idea and I think that uh, regarding this question of ideology and theory um, and, and having the opportunity that we have a, full, a room full of, of students uh, uh, I think that even if from very different ideological and even political positions uh, many authors that are referring here for female and male uh, authors that we are using in sociology, they share this vision of how sociology can contribute to, to, to transform or to, to help societies to achieve their goals. So I was uh, wondering, what do you think if this is really the case nowadays, or which type of theories do we have to teach for to present in this original purpose of, of sociology? Because, for instance, even Parsons, uh, even if his theory has been used uh, in, in the purposes that you were saying, Michael, uh, he published in, in 1966 the uh, Negro American that it was really uh, a way to explain and to, to, to include all the all what, was, what was going on in the civil rights movement in the States into his theory, into his own theory. So I think that he was also having this purpose of, of uh, through his science to contribute to, to society. So, so how do you see uh, today's and, and how we can, from the universities, we can teach uh, sociological theories that are responding to this original purpose? <laughs> Most of your question is to make it, but there's one point and I use for clarifying that I am not saying that we say the quote was a terrorist. I am saying also that all these books defend pederast and sexual violence. And of course, I am not saying that we should destroy the books. Unfortunately, I have had to read all these books and to discuss them, and some of them several times, because it's uh, but we should really read and understand it through discussion. For instance, in the book you are lying at discipline and balance. Most people say, most followers of course say 
that his analysis of the different powers you said, you, you say, no? disciplinary and so on, provide us the elements to fight power. And this is not true. It's just the opposite of what he's saying all the time. For instance, in this book, in the French original version, from pages 190 to 200, mm -hmm. he said that we should not understand power as one negative thing. That power is positive. Never Foucault has been against power. Never. So, if I say that should not be a reference, for instance, for fighting yeah, or against sexual violence, it's not for his conduct, not only, but mainly because all he has written is in favor of that his sexuality and so on. And it's not only a values problem, it's an intellectual problem. It's very silly. I can't use Hugo for defending the depenalization of rape, as he defended. But it's not for penalization of rape. It's just not knowing what he said and what he wrote. And it's very typical in post-structure based followers. They do not read the books they are talking about. And I was in a plane with one of the most important experts on the reader, and I was rereading. The grammatology. And he asked me, Do you understand this? I never could read it. This is what I emphasize. That's fantastic intervention from my point of view. So we're in agreement. So we could then read for co together and have a conversation. Yes. Irrespective, <laughs> and, and others do, yeah. irrespective of who he was. Oh. Okay. All right. <laughs> So that was going to be obviously partially my answer. So now we can have a discussion about what's in discipline and punishment. All right. He, what he does, and that's what I, well, that was my example, was how students suddenly saw the world around them as a panoptica. They saw the world around them, that, and women in particular, began to see how they were constituted as objects in a way that men were not, that they were being continually surveilled. They became feminists by reading Foucault. That was before they actually read the feminism in the course. But they could see that their lives was actually, they was continually subject to surveillance, examination, normalization in their day-to-day -day lives. That was an idea that came from Foucault the idea of disciplinary power. So it is the fact that people began to understand power in a different way that was so, I would say, emancipating. Now, we talk about positive power. What was Picot saying when he talked about positive power? He was saying that people unknowingly participate in these structures of power. The relationship between me and you, supposedly dialogic, but it's a power relationship. Just look at you. You're looking at me. I'm exercising power over you, but it's positive power because I'm eliciting your consent to taking me seriously. That is what he meant by positive power, that the world is actually constituted so that we actively participate in the reproduction of our own subjugation. Now, you may not agree with that, and it doesn't talk a lot about resistance, but it stimulates resistance. Once you realize that you've been hoodwinked by me, then you will leave the room. Well, no, it's so deep in you that you'll stay in the room. Positive power is very powerful. And that is what he's, it elicits participation. I spent a lot of my life watching workers on the shop floor participate in their own exploitation. Very much along the lines 
that Foucault describes in Discipline and Punish. What was your part? Uh, question. Well, we answered one of them. Yes, with the Bible Foucault, which we are not happy with. Oh, then there's science and democracy. Yes. I did have an answer to answer in my head, but I lost it after hearing of a <laughs> Yes. I think quite Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even from very distant positions, the original purpose of sociology, the way that it was founded, it was to contribute right. to societies, to self understanding of our government. So, do you think that this is still relevant? Uh, and this yeah. type of sociological theory we have to teach? Yeah. At least we have. yeah, well, of course, you know, insofar as the great theorists, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, are pushed aside, we lose track of the very powerful values that propel their work. I think what has happened to sociology since its inception at the end of the 19th century is that, to use the word that Ramon used, it has been, well, he didn't he use the word bureaucratization, I would say professionalized, so that we have been increasingly obsessed with the scientific character of sociology. And we have started measuring everything and correlating everything and have lost sight of those bigger values. They've not disappeared, but they are certainly in recession. And that is why there are two, there are two forces against examination of grand theory. On the one hand, there are the post-colonialists, who say, no, these guys were misguided in their vision of the world, missing the significance of their own positionality in the theories that they developed. But there is also the people who are really true scientists, the positivist scientists, who say, ah, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, they didn't know what science was, they never did science, and that's antiquated, that's from the last century, you forget about them. Those scientists, in my view, are losing sight of precisely the values that I think sociology stands for. So I'm for resurrecting grand theory in its different forms, and perhaps bringing other grand theorists into the picture. And there are contemporary ones, I don't know, like Bourdieu, like Habermas, like Foucault. It turns out that they're men, and white men. Um, Two boys, of course, is black, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question about, anyway, no, I won't go there. Um, but yes, I, I think that we, and we should, we should begin to think about it. Feminism is an interesting story because, you know, there's, feminism emerged from a social movement. And it had a character of being very um, politicized and full of concerns with the immediate, and then was historicized, but I don't think it's, it, has, it has been there to criticize these grand theories. I think that has been its function in this scheme of things, as well, of course, as to, that has really changed the world, one way or another, feminist, feminist theory. Yeah. And now, of course, it's subject to its own routine, but nevertheless, it's really, I think of all the theorists that, for example, I'm, I, I teach in my theory courses, feminists, and I'm going to teach Simone de Beauvoir. For me, she is the one to um, instantiate a dialogue with those male theorists, the male of Durkheim, also Foucault, and also Fanon. Um, so she so represents, and then of course she sort of, in my view, inaugurates a, a radical feminism of the 80s, um, which of course is much more pluralized. But even feminism gets institutionalized. Uh, I'll leave it at that. We can continue with some comments from the so. Yes. Thank you both for your contributions very much, and I appreciate the possibility to be 
here discussing with you is a privilege. And regarding uh, the debate that we are having, um, Jane Adams, for example, uh, in, in, his, in her book, in her writings, explained the way how sometimes the training of the education that the young people are receiving are discarded in them to be active in society for social transformation. And I have this feeling sometimes in sociology, in the sociology day, you know, with our students, because they feel it for like four years and they are completely discouraged you know, to make things for changing society sometimes. So thanks to the contribution of you both, no, with comic sociology, technology, theory, or real topias, we can encourage to our st students to think that something is possible to be done and, and it will cover the original values of sociology, no, towards democracy and equality. No? Um, and so my question is um, how the scientific knowledge need to be created, no? uh, taking as a reference all your theories, no? For the, for the young people know how to do this in order to contribute to do that, no? Because sometimes they are lost, no? They don't know what to do. And they need that, your theories, no? They need your theories in order to combat all the postmodernism um, attack, no? Towards this possibility and, and understanding the possibility of knowledge, no? I remember your, your writing on, in which you are talking about uh, sociology as a social movement. Uh, trying to combat the commodification of the, uh, the production of knowledge, I think that's of Polanyi, as you analyze how you can how we can uh, explain to our students that it's possible to do that, and uh, according to your theories. No? Thanks for talking too much here, but okay, all right. Now I, I have. Uh, I'm sorry, I will turn your question upside down. <laughs> I don't think theory is the way to get to undergraduates immediately. I was, I was talking to a friend, a Polish sociologist, who's now teaching in Paris, Mr. Um, two days ago, and she's teaching in one of the universities in Paris, and she has largely um, Students who come originally, or their parents come from largely Africa. And what she does, so actually it's an anthropology course, but it would be a sociology course. Even though there are 100 students, she takes them through the neighborhoods and asks them to participate in the soup kitchens as part of the course. And of course, that is a very effective way of expanding their imagination, particularly if it's done in conjunction with teaching anthropology. I think it's that practical intervention. And I'm sure on this point, never can be definitely sure, but I think on this point, Ramon will be agree as part of the, 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 the dialogic idea that I think bringing, and I often find when teaching ethnography courses, that is the way that people's ideas are expanding. Then once they are become interested, and often they go back to the field time and time again, because they get so involved in the field and in thinking about what the field means to them and their lives. Because these are often middle class students because that's the only way they could have got into the university they begin to think about the world differently. So I think the spark is perhaps that engagement in society. And I often find the most people, the people most receptive to social theory are often those who come from a underprivileged background and then find themselves in a university like Berkeley, which assumes a sort of middle-class student. And then they begin to confront these theorists, whoever those theorists are, and their eyes light up because they begin to see the world differently. So I think linking, linking what we do in the classroom to the lived experience of the students and then also of other communities is exactly the way to actually get them interested in social theory. Pushing social theory down their throats immediately is not the way to go. So when I teach social theory, I'm always coming up with examples. I think the best teachers are able to do that. I'm not very good at it, but I have teaching assistants who are very good at it. But the point is, 
but the point is to actually sort of make theory live. I call it living theory. That's what I have my course in, living theory. That they should be living in their daily lives. As they read Marx for six, eight weeks, they should be living Marx, seeing Marx everywhere in their lives. But also I want them to see that theory itself lives. It's a dynamic and changes, and it's full of conflicts and contradictions. And so, yeah, I think it's bringing people into context, their own, their own or other people's context that really makes theory relevant. I really like your explanation of using co-creation in your teaching. <laughs> Very good. I knew you would agree with me. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I, I will have a, a comment and a question, um, and it's that I'm glad to know that you say uh, that feminists came from social movements. I, I'm glad about that because I understood before that because within Foucault we became feminists. So I'm glad your clarification. So thank you for that. And and my I question. I face lights up. <laughs> I was really worried about that. And my question is because of that. So I think that many struggles came, came in from women because women, uh, we did not need to read Foucault or anyone to know that there were power relationships in the world. And we need, uh, and, and we knew how, how to overcome it. That's the reason because feminist is feminism. And another thing is we should also, as you said before, um, to think about the concept of feminism and who think is feminist or who is fighting for the transformation of the reality through feminism and who is not. But in any case, my question is to think how sociology and social theory should contribute to uh, visualize those uh, struggles that women, and specific women, are doing around instead of being silenced for many of those was still uh, teaching sociology, but also writing about sociology. So how, how this kind of living sociology or dialogic sociology from Ramon, I, my question is for both, uh, should contribute to include those women that are still on the back because some people, not only men, but also many women, uh, we're using those power relationships that we knew already existed, but because we want to transform that uh, and, and becoming more, more democratic. So, so how democracy and socialism should contribute to the feminism in that way? That's my question. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's clear. No, we have to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. My answer is the same as the intention of the, the question. Feminism uh, has been created by many women, surely, in history, but uh, the protagonism of women has been very clear. Uh, I agree that uh, feminists, uh, much uh, before uh, Foucault was born, uh, was very strong. For instance, in Catalonia, Catalonia we had the first feminist movement, the most the strongest feminist movement in the 30s, so 20,000, three women, workers, very young, and still what they wrote at that time yeah, is very inspiring for us, yeah, not only in terms of social movement, in terms of personal life and, and so on. And they were fighting here against Franco and then they went to France and they fight against Hitler. Why? At the same time, Simone de Beauvoir, who was not feminist, was against feminist. He was collaborating with the Petain regime and working for them. Hmm? Simone de Beauvoir discovered, as Ariane just quoted her, feminists in the travel, treat his name 
the United States after the end of the Second World War. Well, it comes back to the same point, which is that I'm afraid that a bit of a distraction from what you are asking, but it's still important to recognize that Simone de Beauvoir was the book that feminists were reading when they were engaged in social movements in the 70s and 80s. Now, 80s, as you know, already sort of been somewhat eclipsed for interesting reasons. But she was the one who was inspiring them. All right, well, let's see. That's well, I'm from the Anglophone world, certainly in England and the United States, and perhaps not in France, perhaps not in Europe. Um, but yeah, I think that she, yes, well, okay, well, we disagree, we have to go and do the empirical research. But, but still, the point is this, that because I don't know the history of Simone de Beauvoir's relationship to the different groups and the Nazi occupation. And it is true that she became a feminist after the war, and it was a sort of epiphany to her. But the book, The Second Sex, certainly stimulates a lot of co-creation and dialogue about who women are. What is this thing, woman? Um, and inspired a lot of the feminism that people like um, McKinnon, people like Anne Oakley, um, these are all feminists from the United States. Um, and then she was subject, has been of course subject to fundamental critique uh, in the 70s and 80s um, from feminists for her supposedly misogynism because she was very contemptuous of those women trapped, those women trapped in the home. And rather than, in a sense, trying to understand them, as other feminists are, she was somewhat contemptuous of them. She had a conception of women emancipated in the public sphere. Um, and so she was criticized. But again, what's, what's so interesting is the debates, rather than dismissing people, to understand where these different feminists come into. That is what the power of feminism is. It's the debates, and some have been very vitriolic. That is the power of an intellectual system, an intellectual world in which we live. There's no simple answer. That there are different answers, and we should be in a business of dialogue. So no, I don't dismiss Simone de Beauvoir. This is great, you know. I never had such a clear, this clear differences with somebody I love and admire. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a man rather than a woman too, it's very good. Okay, all right. Well, I think that uh, on the note, we can uh, conclude this uh, debate. Thank you very much to both our speakers for all your insights and for your...